Hello and welcome to episode 4 of the Shropshire Pilot Vlogcast. I'm Luke, a student helicopter pilot from Shropshire. Hey, no you're not. Who are you? I'm Luke, a private helicopter pilot from Shropshire. Be gone! Yes, I finally passed my skill test and got my private pilot license, but this is just the beginning, so I'll be continuing to document my experience, and as it's been a while since my last video, we've got loads to talk about, so if you're working towards your own skill test, I'm sure you'll find this video useful. Let's do this. Whether you're a rotary or fixed wing pilot, the process of getting a license is similar, but just be aware that I'm sharing my personal experience of the PPL for helicopters, so always seek professional advice from your flight instructor or training organisation. This video also assumes that you've already passed the PPL theoretical knowledge exams, so if that's not the case, check out my previous video first. There are timestamps in the description along with links to all the forms and reference materials you need. Next up on the to-do list after the PPL exams is the Flight Radio Telephony Operator's License. To get one of these, you need to pass a practical test demonstrating that you understand compliant phraseology and have achieved the knowledge and skills required to safely operate radio equipment on board aircraft in accordance with the CAA Radio Telephony Manual CAP 413. The test consists of a simulated VFR flight and a series of scenario-based questions, and you'll need photo identification, form SRG1171, evidence of passing the communications exam, a current half mil chart, a ruler and chart pens, and a way of taking notes. During the simulated flight, you play the role of the pilot and the examiner plays the role of any ATSU you might require. You get to choose the aircraft call sign and the examiner will randomly select a route and give you 20 minutes to plan. This isn't much time, but as it's a simulated flight, you don't need to work everything out, so just focus on plotting the route and writing down the frequencies you'll need along the way. A minimum of one emergency will be examined and you're expected to transmit a relevant emergency call in full and in the correct order. On my test, the examiner left the room and we used two-way radios to communicate. The route I was given took me through a maths and controlled airspace and I had to deal with a rough running engine, a diversion and getting lost. Once the simulated flight was over, the examiner came back into the room to ask the scenario-based questions which were mostly around the distress and diversion and safety comm frequencies. On completing the test, the examiner told me I'd passed and showed me a short presentation on airspace infringement before filling out the necessary paperwork. All of this might sound a bit stressful, but the whole process only took about an hour, the test is conducted at your own pace, and even in the emergency section you've got 30 seconds to respond, so take a deep breath and think about what you're going to say before you speak. The candidate guidance document for the test, which is called CAP 2325, tells you everything you need to know and has a very useful aid memoir at the end, which you can take into the test along with the frequency reference card and any notes you make during planning. Ultimately, the examiner wants you to pass, and if you prepare in the ways I'm going to suggest next, you should have no problems. In early 2022, the UK CAA made the test slightly more difficult in an effort to address the use of the non-standard phraseology you will have heard throughout your training. Here's an example. Uh, Oscar, India, India, Oscar. Robinson R-22 helicopter, Welshpool 2, Welshpool via Aberystwyth. Uh, let's see here, we're uh, currently 10 miles to the west of Welshpool at uh, 2,500 feet on 1033. 2 POB, PPL, BFR, request a basic service please. Ignoring the silly accent, that might sound familiar, and although it does convey the required flight details, here's another example. Golf Oscar, India, India, Oscar, R22 helicopter, Welshpool 2 Slape, 10 miles northwest of Welshpool, 2000 feet, 1001, VFR tracking direct to Slape, request basic service. It's a quicker pace with no ums and ahs or extra words, but it also sounds a bit more professional. By thinking before you transmit and confidently using standard phraseology, you're not only reducing your workload and helping the controller, but also contributing to flight safety by freeing up the airwaves for others. This is the general mindset you should have for the test, but to be more specific, just stick to CAP 413 and you'll have a good chance of passing first time. If you've picked up some bad habits or just want to practice more, using the radio in the aircraft during your flight lessons is a good way to build your confidence, but there are cheaper ways to do this. A quick Google search will bring up various providers offering radio telephony training using pre-recorded scripts and even artificial intelligence, but if I had to recommend one it would be Wilco Radio, as the team behind it are actual pilots and it's good value for money. As a musician, I took it one step further and recorded my own scripts. Runway 22, standard helicopter departure to the north, cleared for takeoff. 
Runway 22, standard helicopter departure to the north, cleared for takeoff, Golf Delta Sierra. Yes, I sound like an absolute madman, and it's not as polished as Wilco Radio, but this helped me practice on the way to work and also improved my listening skills. Another option is VATSIM, which is a free global network that provides real-time radio communication for PC flight simulators, but in my experience, although the controllers are great, other pilots often use even more non-standard phraseology than in real life. Once you've got the radio license, there's only one hurdle left before the finish line, the PPL skill test. <laughs> it's not that bad, but to pass it, you need to demonstrate to an examiner that you can competently carry out the procedures and maneuvers you've been taught during your training, and the test includes a number of sections representing the different phases of flight. Failing an item within a section will result in the failure of that section, and if you do fail a section, you can repeat it, but if you fail more than one, you'll fail the test overall. Your result will either be pass, fail, or partial pass, which means you only have to retake the section or items you failed, so if you make a mistake, try to forget about it and focus on the task at hand, because it might not be going as badly as you think. In aviation, it's widely recognised that we all make mistakes, and your examiner certainly won't be expecting perfection given the stressful circumstances. It's easier said than done, but try to calm your nerves in whatever way works for you and remember that some stress is actually good for your performance. You'll also be expected to demonstrate your knowledge of pre-flight operations, so make sure you can confidently give a briefing and conduct a thorough pre-flight A check of the aircraft. In the UK, it seems we have it slightly easier than our US counterparts because in their equivalent checkride pre-flight section, examiners will often ask far more questions, but then we have to pass more written exams, so it probably balances out. The only reason I mention this is because if you stumble across a US checkride video like I did, you could become unnecessarily worried about the pre-flight section. I'm not saying you should completely relax about it, but there's definitely no need to memorise all your textbooks. If you want to know exactly what the skill test will include for your aircraft category, check out CAA Standards Document 19, as it literally tells you everything you need to know and has some useful tips for managing stress too. As you read through it, write down anything you're unsure about and either look it up yourself or ask your flight instructor. Similarly, if there are any exercises you don't feel confident about, ask if you can practice them during your next flight, as there's no shame in repeating lessons if it gives you a better chance of passing first time. When you feel ready to book the test, your flight school should be able to put you in touch with an examiner, but it could take a while due to availability and weather, so plan ahead and don't be too disappointed if it gets rescheduled. While you're waiting, the best you can do is fly regularly to maintain your skills and ensure your theoretical knowledge is up to date. The CAA Skyway Code is an excellent resource for this. On the morning of my skill test, I woke up to a dense fog due to light winds, but undeterred, I still showed up at the airport so early that no one else was even there. When the examiner arrived, we discussed the weather and decided to wait and see if the fog would clear, so we briefed the flight, which included a navigation section, confined area, instrument flight, emergency procedures and low-level manoeuvres, and I was given an hour to plan the route. It's at this point that the test really begins, because as PIC you're responsible for the safe conduct of the flight, and that starts with planning, so here's a quick montage of my process so you can compare it to yours. First, I check the weather using the Met Office Aviation Briefing Service, local terminal aerodrome forecasts, and meteorological terminal aerodrome reports, and write down the wind direction and speed on the flight log. Next, I use the National Air Traffic Service's Aeronautical Information Products Internet Briefing System to find notices to aviation and mark them on the chart. Then I plot the route corrected for wind variation and deviation, complete fuel and loading calculations, and write down all the required information. Finally, I use Pooley's Flight Guide to find frequencies and familiarize myself with the departure and destination aerodromes. With this flight planning done, I briefed the examiner using the mated format, which is a convenient way of making sure you don't miss anything. M is MET, or weather, so forms 214, 215, TAFs and METARs. A is aircraft, so documents like the COA, ARC, maintenance schedule, insurance, weight and balance, tech log and fuel plan. T is traffic, so ATSUs, frequencies, radio aids, squawk codes, services required and no TAMs. E is exercise, so a general overview of the objectives for the flight. And D is duties, so who's PIC and what you'll do in the event of an emergency. Next, we went out to the aircraft to complete the pre-flight checks, and this was actually a bit more challenging than I was expecting. Fortunately, I'd watched quite a few pre-flight check videos on YouTube, so I was able to answer most of the examiner's questions, but it wasn't as straightforward as just reading the checklist out loud, so make sure you know the main components and can clearly describe what they do. At this point, the fog had cleared and we made the decision to proceed with the flight. Getting into the helicopter with the examiner is when I felt most nervous, but halfway through the startup checklist I calmed down and the training kicked in almost subconsciously, so hopefully that'll happen for you too. 
On the first leg of the navigation, I used the quarter mil chart to maintain heading, altitude and speed. On the second leg, I navigated to a waypoint using an OS map. And on the third leg, I went back to the quarter mil for a track crawl, which didn't go quite according to plan as I flew more of a curve than a straight line, but still arrived at the destination. After this, the examiner asked me to demonstrate how to use the GNSS and gave me a diversion scenario before indicating the confined area I had to make an approach to. Next, I had to fly the aircraft with sole reference to instruments using foggles, which are partially opaqued glasses that simulate IMC. Following this, we moved on to the emergency section, with the examiner asking me to perform basic and max range auto rotations before closing the throttle on me for a practice forced landing. On the way back to the airfield, the examiner switched the governor off, which is the device that automatically maintains RPM, so my approach and landing were completed with manual throttle adjustments. With the governor back on again, I completed the low-level manoeuvre section, which included a rather more abrupt running landing than I would have liked, and finished the test by carefully following the shutdown checklist so I wouldn't blow it at the last minute. Hearing that you've passed after months of hard work is a feeling you won't forget quickly. I couldn't quite believe it at first, but after it sank in, the sense of achievement was amazing, and to be honest, it was quite a relief. You may have heard people say the PPL is a license to learn, and although that's true, you should still enjoy the moment and look forward to building on your experience. And there's nothing like a bit of paperwork to bring the mood down, but it's got to be done to get your license. The CAA application process for the PPL is now paperless, so you need to scan and certify the required documents, fill out an online form and pay the fee. You'll need Course Completion Certificate Form CAA 5016, the Examiner's Report, Proof of Level 6 English Language Proficiency, and certified copies of your passport or driving license and logbook pages. They usually process applications within 10 days, but it can take longer when they're busy or there's an issue with your paperwork, so double check everything before you send it. So how long does it take to get the PPL? Well, apparently the average for helicopters is 18 months and 70 hours, and I'd say that's realistic, because I've been doing as much as I can whilst also working two jobs to pay the bills, and it took me 16 months, 21 days, and 66.3 hours. If you're on an integrated course or don't have many other responsibilities, you could definitely do it quicker, but I found it useful not to have my expectations or deadlines set in stone. It's good to have goals, but try not to be too hard on yourself if you miss them. Just focus on what's next and keep going. Once you've got this piece of paper, you're an officially licensed pilot, and I'd like to say a big thank you to Jerry, Josh, Dan and James, the whole team at Wizard Helicopters and Welsh Bournemouth Wales Airport, and everyone who supported me, but especially my parents, as I couldn't have come this far without them. So that's it for today's episode, and as usual, if you have any questions, just leave a comment or contact me on Instagram or TikTok. Next, I'm hour building towards the commercial license, so I should be posting videos more frequently from now on. Have a great day and happy flying.